uh, bring to the board's attention that we have new education in front of us. If you will take a look at that, so we're ready for that. Alrighty, I'm going to turn this over to Rosie and Glenn, and I understand that uh, Rosie, you worked very diligently to get us our speaker. So it's your honor to introduce her, if you would do so, please. Sure. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Elizabeth Latterman. She is um, a senior outreach economist at the San Francisco Federal Reserve. Good morning. Oh, afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, Rosie. Welcome. Can we bring up the first slide in my presentation? Or maybe it's full. Okay, great. So uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here. You know, the U.S. economy is a beast. I'm trying to understand what's going on uh, in the economy, you know, every aspect of what's going on at any point in time is really complex. So what I'd like to do this afternoon is to offer you a vantage point from which to view the economy. We'll be up at 10,000 feet and we'll be looking at the U.S. economy as a whole. And we'll have our sights on, our focus on, the two goals that Congress has given the Fed for monetary policy, the so-called dual mandate goals of maximum employment and stable prices. Now, we're a small enough group here that I want everyone to feel free to jump in with any questions that you may have along the way. And also, now's a good time for me to say that I, although I will do my best to reflect the views of the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, uh, my remarks, should I misspeak, represent my own views and not necessarily those of anybody else <laughs> within the Federal Reserve System. But I don't think I'll be too, off, too, far, too far off the mark. So before we go any further, I want to remind you of the definition of maximum employment when we're talking about the dual mandate. It has a very, very important operational meaning, and here's what I'm talking about. We just said there are two goals for monetary policy, maximum employment and stable prices. They're interrelated. If employment is too high, inflation tends to pick up, tends to increase. So it may be where you want it now, but it's not going to stay there. And if employment is too low, inflation tends to decrease. So when we're talking about the dual mandate, maximum employment needs not too low, certainly. And it also means not too high. In between, a level that's just right to keep inflation steady. Now, our uh, former, as of last month, uh, President John Williams uh, liked to talk about the natural rate of unemployment, which is this concept of maximum employment expressed in terms of the unemployment rate. So the, the unemployment rate that corresponds to this idea, this concept of maximum employment is, as you may know, called the natural rate of unemployment. And he liked to put it in very intuitive terms. When we're at the natural rate of employment, anybody who is looking for a job can find a job. And the uh, San, Francisco's, San, Fr San Francisco Fed's estimate of the natural rate of unemployment is about 4.6%. Now, the other reserve banks may have slightly different estimates. The board might have its own estimate. Uh, academic economists outside of the Federal Reserve System and private economists, but they're all going to be roughly around that level. Now, stable prices as you probably know, doesn't mean prices don't, that don't move at all. It doesn't mean zero inflation. It means an average annual inflation rate of about 2%. So what are we going to see from up here? What, what does the economy look like and, and where are we headed? Well, uh, we're going to see that uh, GDP growth, output growth, will continue to exceed what we call the trend rate of growth. The trend rate of growth is just, an, is just a fancy name for long-run 
normal sustainable growth. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about ter, uh, trend growth later. Now, when the economy is growing faster, more quickly than, than, tr than the long run trend, uh, that goes hand in hand with a tendency for the unemployment rate to decline. And we're already beyond maximum employment. So we are you know, we're forecasting that we're gonna stay beyond maximum employment or put the other way that the unemployment rate is going to stay below the natural rate for the, over the forecast period. And with the labor market so tight then, we do expect inflation to pick up. And we actually, over, over the forecast period of the next uh, two and a half years, we're expecting that inflation will head actually a little higher than 2%. So we're gonna start with GDP growth. It's the best single measure of the health of the economy. And it's the basis for the rest of our discussion. So we're gonna spend a fair amount of time on this topic. So here's our, our GDP growth chart. Uh, real GDP, that means it's adjusted for inflation. GDP, of course, is gross domestic product, the value of all goods and services produced in the United States. The solid line is the actual data, and the dotted line is our forecast. Now, um, if you have seen, if you've looked at these charts in the past, and even the fairly recent past, you may, know, you may notice that there is something missing from this chart. There's no gray bar depicting the recession. The recession is not even in the rearview mirror anymore. This expansion as of May um, exceeded the length of the 1960s expansion. So as far back as our data go, I think until back maybe to the mid 19th century, uh, the expansion that we're in now is the second longest expansion in history. The 1990s expansion is still about, we're about 12 months off, about a year off from, from, from beating that one. So you may, uh, if you pay attention to these data, you may have <clears throat> read that the final, there are always three estimates for GDP growth that the Bureau of, Ec uh, of Economic Analysis puts out. The final, uh, the final uh, number for quarter one for growth within the first quarter was 2%. Now these quarter to quarter, that's annualized, these quarter to quarter numbers can jump around quite a bit. So on this chart, and we pay attention to um, the percent change from a year earlier, four quarters earlier, and that's what this shows. And that came in at 2.8%. Now looking forward, we're looking at average growth um, over the next two and a half years of about 2.4%. With growth earlier in the period, uh, faster than growth later in the period. What that reflects is a, over time, shrinking boost from, uh, from fiscal stimulus, from the uh, tax cuts and the uh, federal spending bill. So there's a boost, but it shrinks over time. And the downturn, the, the, slow, the slowing of growth also reflects the effects of recent and anticipated chain, uh, increases in interest rates. So that's the broad overview for growth, uh, but there's more to talk about here. What are we supposed to think about 2.4%? Is that fast? Is it slow? So we're gonna put that in some context. We're going to conclu conclude that actually, um, relative to the baseline growth of the economy, it's actually, actually kind of, you know, it's. Fast. It's faster than the baseline growth of the economy. And we're also going to talk about what gives, gives us confidence in our forecast and what's fueling growth. So let's talk about the context here for the 2.4% growth. If you draw, if you just eyeball an average line over the past eight years of growth, you can see it's about in line with that, maybe a little bit faster. It's considerably faster than this trend growth that I've referred to, this long run normal growth. So long run normal growth is that rate of growth stripping out any you know, special circumstances or one-off events like hurricanes or oil price shocks or an accommodative monetary policy. It's just sort of the economy humming along at its baseline sustainable long run pace. We estimate that that's about 1.8%. We can ask another question. 
we can sort of step back even more and say 1.8%. What are we supposed to think about 1.8%? Is that fast or slow? Well, it's considerably slower than it used to be. Back in the uh, early 2000s, it was about 4%. So, you know, roughly speaking, about twice as fast. So what happened? Well, there are two uh, things, two things that happened. Uh, one is that in contrast to the 1960s through the 1990s, when you had uh, the labor force participation rate increasing, uh, at least partly because uh, women were joining the labor force in increasing numbers, we've had a decline in the labor force participation rate. So a decline in the number of non-institutionalized people at least 16 years old who either have a job or are actively looking for a job, a decline in that proportion. So, uh, and over roughly the same period, we've had a decline in the population growth rate. So combined, those two mean a decline in the growth of the labor force. Now, let's think of a decline in the growth of the labor force as a decline in the growth of the number of hours that are actually worked in the United States. It's still growing, but it's growing more slowly than it used to. On top of that, the growth in the amount of stuff, goods or services that, that we produce per hour of work has also slowed. This is called productivity. Productivity growth has also slowed. Productivity growth now is estimated to be between about one and one and a quarter percent per year. So this year, you know, we're about more efficient about by about one percent more than, they, than we were last year. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, it was more like two to three percent. So uh, the combination of slower labor force growth and slower productivity growth means slower trend growth of, of output, trend growth of the economy uh, than we used to have. So um, growth, though, is, as I said, is faster than this we're forecasting for the next uh, uh, two and a half years, faster than this trend growth. So what gives us confidence in that forecast? And what are some of the pillars supporting that growth? Well, one thing that gives us confidence in the forecast is that it's, uh, it's widespread up across a variety of sectors and across a, uh, across a variety of, 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 of regions of the country. So uh, some numbers that are coming in strong are the all-important um, consumer spending. Uh, business investment has been strong for quite a while. That's showing strong numbers. Uh, manufacturing, actually, manufacturing activity has been strong. Uh, 50, that is, every state in the country is showing a positive number for its, what the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia uh, constructs a, its state coincident index. So they have an index of economic activity for all of the states. And it's, uh, it's showing positive for every single state. This is significant because in the Great Recession, every single state experienced a recessionary economy. This was in contrast to the preceding four recessions. So this is, this is, uh, this is, this is important. So what, what are some of the pillars supporting growth? And here we're going to be thinking mostly about consumer spending, uh, which, as you know, is two thirds of, of, of GDP, or uh, you know a little bit of, about business too, but mostly about consumer. So um, incomes are our incomes are going up. So many businesses, as you probably know, are facing shortages of workers. So these are data from the National Federation of Independent Business, which are, are small businesses. Over 90% of businesses in the United States have fewer than, well, not over 90%, about 90% of businesses in the United States have fewer than 20 employees. So what this chart is showing you is that these small businesses that say they have few or no qualified job applicants is uh, 
at a historical peak, higher than even before the recession. And so naturally, with businesses um, finding it more difficult to find qualified workers, uh, these businesses have uh, been increasing wages um, over the, uh, and that's, that's, been, that's been trending up. And more and more of these businesses are planning to do that within the next few months. Now, when we look at uh, wages, not just for small businesses, but for, for the economy overall, the wage, wage growth is trending up. And you can see it even more if you look at wages uh, plus benefits. Uh, another thing that's supporting consumer spending is strong confidence. So never, uh, never underestimate the role of, 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 of sentiment. In, uh, in spending or investment, consumer confidence is at a, also at a historical peak. And um, financial conditions, what about financial conditions? Well, interest rates have increased notably uh, since the longer term interest rates since the beginning of the year. The federal funds rate the, uh, started increasing earlier than that. Uh, but they're still relatively low by by historical standards. And then also we have uh, st the stock market has you know, seen some volatility recently, but has retained almost all of its gains uh, since the beginning of 2017. So all of these things are supporting growth. With growth faster than trend, that tends to go hand in hand with a tendency for the unemployment rate to decline. So uh, indeed, in our forecast here, you can barely see, but it's there, a forecasted decline in the unemployment rate. It's, I think, the, the, the trough there is about, uh, for uh, early 2019, is about 3.5%. Now, the unemployment rate in June actually increased a little bit. It went from 3.8% in May to 4% in June. Part of that is because of... Um, uh, at least part of it, is because there was an increase in the labor force participation rate. Remember, I mentioned the labor force participation rate. And that can uh, increase the, um, the, uh, the unemployment rate, even with strong job growth, you know, more and more people getting jobs, which we're going to see in a couple slides. So um, importantly, the unemployment rate currently is below our estimate that I mentioned before of the natural rate of unemployment. And uh, that will be important when we talk about what's, what we forecast for inflation. So um, one of the things that's naturally that's been uh, fueling the downward trend in the unemployment rate is strong job growth. So these are monthly numbers. and. Uh, uh, the other charts tend to be not so frequent. We put we 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 show these actual monthly numbers because they they're uh, they're numbers that many people are familiar with. And um, if you subscribe to a new news service uh, during during the the financial crisis and early in the recovery, uh, you probably got a ping on your device on the morning of the first Friday of every month telling you what the employment situation was. Uh, as I said, these numbers can be quite volatile. If you, for example, if you look back, although they're seasonally adjusted, there's always surprises that come along. That 2017 number back in that really short bar back uh, in September was because of, largely because of hurricanes. And then we had this crazy large number in February. So we, t so we wanna look at something that's a little smoother series. So we look at this six month moving average and, um, so over the last six months, uh, job growth has, has you know, been about 213,000 uh, 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 per month. Importantly, uh, job growth remains uh, well above what we think of as kind of the break-even rate of job growth. So some people put this number more at 100,000, somewhere between 80,000 and 100,000. The amount, the number of jobs that the economy needs to generate to keep the unemployment rate from going up 
as more and more people, you know, there's population growth and so forth, as people enter the labor market. So sort of to keep the unemployment rate steady, it needs to, the, the, the economy needs to generate between 80 and 100,000 jobs per month. And we're, and we're well above that. So with uh, the unemployment rate below the natural rate, uh, that tends to go hand in hand with, uh, with a, uh, the tendency for the inflation rate to increase. So here's, the, uh, here's our chart for the inflation rate. There are a few things to talk about here. One is that um, these, many people are familiar with the consumer price index. This is a slightly different index called the PCE, Personal Consumption Expenditure Index. The two series follow each other very closely and they're both meant to measure uh, changes in the price of a market basket of goods and services that the typical, typical consumer um, uh, 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 purchases. Um, the personal consumption expenditures index uh, is updated more frequently than the consumer price index for changes in that basket of goods and services. So it's a little bit more up to date, a little more accurate uh, with respect to what people are actually buying. It also, uh, the PCE in contrast to the CPI, includes uh, the payments of third parties, for example, um, uh, in your insurance company when, it, when you uh, get uh, medical services. So um, the, uh, in, in the first quarter data, we've got uh, one point, I think that's 1.8% for the overall PCE price index and 1.6% for the core. The difference between overall and core is the core excludes the effects of changes in energy prices and food prices. And it's not because economists don't eat and economists don't drive. It's because those energy and food prices are very volatile. And um, so we can get a better sense of underlying trends if we strip those out. And the core does you know, over time, the overall, uh, you know, kind of fluctuates around the core. Uh, around the core, so the core is used for forecasting. Uh, so, um, the I want to say a couple things about the uh, forecast for overall inflation. There, um, so there's kind of a bump up and then a bump down inflation that reflects higher oil prices now. Than, uh, than, than last year, than in 2017. And then um, uh, gradually, and then the, the, a succession of, of such year over year gaps that gradually roll out of the year over year calculation as, as, as we move out of uh, the period of increasing oil prices. You know, our, our, our stance is our, we don't forecast oil prices, uh, but um, we look at oil futures markets and we, you know, pretty much judge that oil prices are not going to move a lot from where they are now. We, you know, we, you might say that we're really not taking any position up or down about oil prices. So anyway, um, and then the, um, the uh, I also wanted to comment on the uh, lower inflation back in 2017, which we're you know, forecasting to come, come out of that period. There were some special factors in 2017. There were actual declines in the price of, um, for example, pharmaceuticals, um, airline tickets, cell phone services. Uh, and importantly, there was a, a cap on um, the uh, allowable growth in Medicare spending, which had effects on growth in medical uh, in, in in health in health services uh, generally, so those effects are expected to also roll out of the calculation and help to bring bring up uh, inflation. Uh, it's also uh, so we've had a we've had a somewhat tight labor market for a while. It always takes a little bit of time. Uh, well, you might think it a medium amount of time, maybe one and a half to two years, one, maybe one to two years for a tight labor market to feed through to higher inflation. Uh, it, you just, if you just think about it, first people have to notice that maybe they could get, you know, they have to, you have to kind of get their attention. Uh, they, maybe I could get a, you know, I could get a, a higher wages elsewhere if I switch jobs. Uh, most wage growth takes place 
when people actually switch jobs, not staying within the job that they have, but they switch jobs. So it takes some time for people to figure, oh, yeah, I could go there and make more money. Then they have to, you know, sort of get used to the idea. Then they actually have to take steps. And then they're, they're you know, there's paperwork to be done and moving across the country or whatever to be done. So it takes some time for, for tight labor markets to um, feed through to higher inflation. So um, our conclusion, just to recap, we expect growth to continue to exceed the trend rate. Uh, and we're going to, we expect that we're going to stay beyond maximum employment, that is the unemployment rate lower than the natural rate. And inflation should be headed to a little higher than, a little higher than 2% uh, over the next um, two and a half years. So that's the basics on, you know, the Fed, the economy through a Fed monetary policy lens. So I'm happy to take your questions. We can get into any you know, details that you like about any of that that caught your attention. Well, we're going to have a few people, I'm sure, weigh in. So let's start with Sharon. Yeah, thanks so much for coming. We really appreciate your perspective. And I did want, I didn't want to, I wanted you to do your presentation before I asked a question, but it was on an earlier slide towards the beginning of your presentation. And I wanted to make sure I understood. Did you say something along the lines of, Incomes are increasing. Yes. Okay. You know, Can overall, you flesh that <laughs> out for me? Because because yeah, I think really. I think what's challenging when when I I love the Economist. I you know I I love thinking about the economy and hearing from. I think it's fascinating to to have these conversations. And then we all have our own. Just I hang out with community college students in, in yes. inner city Los Angeles, and yes. and their experience, you know, is, is different. And then I just yes. have friends in the private sector who have. So you just get these anecdotal snapshots. Right. And then obviously I live in a in a, a place that has really high housing costs. So right. most people that I hang out with, half of their salary goes to right. rent or a mortgage or things like that. So. <clears throat> I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit more because in, in my world, um, you know, I feel like income inequality is just, I mean, daily seems like it's, you know, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer in my, in, in my little yes. world. And I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more when you say that incomes are increasing. Yes. What do you mean by that as an economist and then help us maybe think about that maybe in places like San Francisco and Los Angeles and... So, um, so, so, so what I mean by that is from, from a very, very macro perspective. So, um, so I'll just start with, with you, know, s you know, sitting as an economist at, at the Fed and thinking about talking to people about monetary policy. So, um, so the Fed is trying to achieve these two things, maximum employment and stable prices. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, it needs to... Uh, it needs to forecast um, what economic growth is going to look like over the next few years and um, what, which direction it needs to push things in order to get economic growth to, to be what it needs to be, to push the unemployment rate in what direction it needs to push, and, there, and you know, in turn to have the effect on inflation that it needs to have. So, um, so it's going to uh, it's going to be looking at very very macro variables that are moving very slowly when one generally very slowly in one direction or another, and uh, part of what it part of what it tries to predict is what's going to happen to, for example, in this case when you're talking about incomes, consumer spending as a whole, the big one single number of you know, growth in consumer spending for everybody in the whole country. And so the reason that incomes are relevant is because incomes, uh, you know, so we looked at wage growth at small firms, and we looked at wage growth overall, and we looked at the growth of, um, of, uh, of, of wages and benefits together. And... Uh, you know, those are both private sector. Pardon me. Across the board, public and yes, private sector. Yes. Yes. Right. And so this this big aggregate number is trending up, and so that's a signal to us that there's this you know pretty solid fundamental force 
that's uh, that's uh, supporting uh, you know continued growth in consumer spending. Mm -hmm. um, another thing, sort of to put that perspective a little bit different way. Uh, you know, people always talk about the Fed having a pretty blunt tool. So the Fed can affect what's going on through monetary policy. It might have, we'll talk about something else in a second. But through monetary policy, it has, it, 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 can, it can move the short-term interest rates, which in effect longer-term interest rates, when, you know, you're interested in training in economics, and so you know about all this. Um, so it has this one blunt instrument, and so it can set the it can it can uh, encourage economic conditions that are uh, and it uses that instrument to do what Congress tes told it to do, and it can use that to encourage economic overall overall aggregate economic conditions that are as beneficial and as conducive as they can be for the rest of society, through, through, be it through the political process or through, um, you know, uh, private investment or whatever, to address some of these other issues like housing affordability, income inequality. Uh, you know, those are just a couple of the ones that you mentioned. So um, now the Fed does, uh, you know, it comes into. Uh, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, okay, the Fed does care about, for example, income inequality, or for example, um, uh, housing affordability. These are two issues that would come up mainly through the Fed's community development function, not through monetary policy. So the Fed, each of the Federal Reserve Banks has a community development uh, department that convenes uh, uh, you know, it convenes lenders, it convenes uh, nonprofit groups. Uh, you know, anybody who has a stake in these issues in a sort of neutral setting, the Fed is thought of as a sort of trusted institution uh, to come together and, uh, uh, you know, talk about these issues, tell, you know, tell each other about best practices, um, you know, all those sorts of things. So... I hope that helps. Yeah, well, the other thing I was just thinking of is student debt. I'm thinking, yeah. you know, is, is a huge issue in terms of when I think right. of students' budgets, right? right? Most of it goes to, or at least half goes to housing, and then there's, if you want a better job, at least in some industries, mm -hmm. getting more education helps your income, and we have a huge student debt issue, you yes. know, across the country, but definitely yes. for California students, and so, yeah. but, but the Fed doesn't really, I mean... The monetary well, policy doesn't, does it kind no, of, yeah, it doesn't no, really influence it doesn't, that. No. So. Um, I went to uh, a, I don't know if we would call it, what was it, a workshop or a symposium or something that was sponsored at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco a couple of years ago. I think a large part of it was educational. And one of, I mean, these, these things often are, right? Uh, but one of the topics, one of the topics of one of the academic speakers was student debt, uh, where we learned that most of the, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to speak in very general terms. I'm not an expert in this area, but what I recall, what we learned was that most of the problem with, uh, uh, you know, in the, again, generalizing the country as a whole, that uh, the uh, the people, well, students really get into trouble if they start college and no finish and have debt. And that uh, it um, it's, tends to be more of a problem at for-profit uh, institutions than, than for students at uh, not-for-profit institutions. So anyway, that's just yeah. sort of meant to be yeah. a concrete demonstration of, of the, Fed's, uh, the Fed's involvement and the type of involvement that they have in these, in these areas. Here. Thanks. Uh, thank you for being here. Thanks for taking time out of your oh, you're welcome. short, impactful, and busy schedule to make time to be with us today. Sure. Um, as you know, <clears throat> the significance of CalSTRS, um, and like most pension funds, uh, if you would look at our portfolio, you would say it's a, a bet on growth. We need you know, growth is good for pension funds. Yes. Uh, um, 
I, I think the Fed, and the older I get, the faster time seems to move. It's hard to believe that it's uh, the, this fall it will be 10 years yes. since the great financial crisis. Right. It seems like yesterday. And I think there's a danger in forgetting where we actually were. Um, so I think the Fed, speaking for myself, it did a remarkable job uh, handling not only where we were as a country, but then coordinated efforts across the globe. Uh, that was a pretty frightening time. Yes. You know, when you think about the implications for pension funds, it was more than frightening. It was terrifying. And if it could have gone, you know, what the Fed did was great, and then critics will say, well, what would the alternative have been? I think based upon any of the other alternatives, what the Fed did and how they acted was the prudent and right thing to do. Um, so that's my tilt. That's my, you know, that's yeah. my bias. That's my view. Um, so having said that, you talked about this expansion, the longest, second longest expansion yes. in history. You right. talk a little bit about the, uh, I've heard people speak about that it was tepid, so that over, the, it's been long, mm -hmm. but the overall expansion itself, um, I've heard people talk about a U recovery versus a V mm -hmm. recovery. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the speed of the expansion versus the length of the expansion? So it was slow. Um, so it, it took longer than usual for, uh, for GDP to get back up to, so if you extrapolate from where GDP was before the recession and take, uh, take a, you know, a long run normal growth rate of that, it took longer to get back onto that path than usual. So it was more like a U than it was like a V, mm. uh, and, um, uh, research suggests that part of the reason for the slowness of the recovery was because there was a financial crisis that accompanied the, you know, that characterized uh, the recession. Not all recessions are accompanied by financial crises. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so. So speaking of crises, yes. no one has a crystal ball. Right. Um, you know, uh, we went from a period of uh, accommodating monetary policy to one in which the Fed is um, gradually increasing rates. Yes. Um, there's been some activity on Twitter today that we won't comment on. Uh, we about, will not. <laughs> we will not. We will not. Just acknowledge that it would happen. Yes. Um, the, um, so what, you know, we're a big ship, so we can't make these you know, we, we move gradually, but we, mm -hmm. it would be helpful to know from your experience and, and people that you speak with, what are some of the signals? We've heard about flattening yield curve. Mm. We've heard about uh, unemployment numbers. We've heard about GDP. What are some of the signals that we should kind of say, oh, that's a little bit of a red flag. We should be cautious about that. And what tools does the Fed have in its toolbox to address the next crisis, As, and that assumes we don't know what the next crisis will be. So, <laughs> right. but in yes. the toolbox that the Fed has now, right. how would it look at that? Well, the Fed, the Fed knows that now, knows now uh, that it has in its toolbox, um, for example, purchasing uh, large scale purchases of long term uh, securities, the quantitative easing that it did. It could do that again. Um, it continues to have, uh, of course, this more standard. Uh, uh, you know, monetary policy. The Fed actually, this is a little bit of a sidebar, uh, the Fed actually manipulates or affects, influences, this is the correct word, the federal funds rate a little bit differently than now than it did before the crisis. But basically, well, let's just, for purposes of this discussion, just say that it, had, you know, it still has the same old kind of open market operations stuff. Um, so um, the... Uh, the, the, some of the things to look for, to pay attention to, some of the areas where you might want to, uh, uh, you know, where there might be red flags, it, for example, with financial markets and whether there are some imbalances in the financial markets, are to pay attention to what's happening with, uh, for example, leverage, uh, what's happening with valuations, are, are there asset classes where money is too much money is ta chasing too few assets. Um, I can say that uh, 
uh, you know, in contrast, just to pick one area, mortgage um, house prices, if you look at a house price index for the country as a whole, it's at or very, very close to what it was before the mortgage crisis. In that situation, though, mortgage debt to income for households was much higher than it is now. So it's a much healthier situation. That, so that's just an example of, of how you might want to take into account um, what's happening with leverage. Uh, so when, I, I mean, if you are reading, uh, you know, commentary or perhaps commentary from Kelsters itself, I don't know if, if you, you know, what kind of uh, uh, regular information comes out, but um, you know, look for things about about those kinds of those kinds of issues. Um, so that, that, those would be my comments. Thank you. Anyone else? Joy. Yes. Hi. Thank you very hi. much for joining us today. Sure. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, both your observations as, as well as any thoughts you have going forward about the impact of the tax cut that was passed late last year. Uh, yeah. I um, you know, you mentioned a little bit earlier um, the, the strength in consumer spending and business investment. I mean, are those things that uh, that you think the tax cut contributed to significantly a little bit? Um, just, you know, any any thoughts on sort of what what the um, data looks like now as well as, um, you know, what you anticipate um, going forward? So um, it's, you know, one never knows how, if we, you can, you know, it's always difficult to tease out because there are so many things moving at once. It's, you know, difficult to tease out what might be due to one thing or, or, or another. Uh, yes, I did mention that, that in our forecast, we're thinking that there is some boost uh, from the, Tax, so the tax cuts and the and the fiscal the spending package, I think it was one point three trillion dollars or something like that. Uh, together, um, we think that um, on the whole, over uh, over you know two to three years, maybe that might have um, uh, boosted uh, GDP growth, maybe about one percentage point higher than it would otherwise have been. Uh, the, fiscal, the fiscal stimulus having come at a time when the economy was already pretty strong raises some, uh, in some people's, I'll just say FOMC participants' minds, uh, the possibility of actually a, a, I don't know whether to call it a downside risk or an upside risk, but the, the economy might get overheated. Uh, so... Uh, uh, but it's sort of on, on the flip side, it might be that we're underestimating the boost to the economy uh, uh, that, you know, might not be, a who knows, might not be accompanied by, you know, inflation that really gets, gets out of hand. So right now we're thinking of it more, out we built it a little bit into the forecast, the effect, and, you know, that dissipates over time. And... Um, uh, it remains the effects of it sort of remain a risk. Nobody's, you know, could be think could be an upside risk or a downside risk uh, to the forecasts for growth and inflation. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Lynn? Uh, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. You're I, welcome. You touched on a little bit about the the high um, home prices that we have now across the country. Yes. Now I was curious about your thoughts on rising income inequality and and high housing costs both ownership and rental markets. And we're seeing a lot of those impacts here in Sacramento, mm -hmm. actually, which is something that I don't think this area has seen right. quite so bad. Right. So again, that's not something, I mean, I, 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 I don't have any expertise in, the, in that area. And it's something, again, these types of issues are not issues that, are, that overlap with, with the overall economic outlook that's tied, uh, you know, that's tied to monetary policy that informs monetary policy. Uh, these are issues that the Fed uh, does care about and does address in its role as a convener. Um, and also, um, you know, to some degree, also, I, I would guess also in its role as a supervisor. So you may know that banks are subject to something called the Community Reinvestment Act which requires them to um, lend in low and moderate income areas uh, um, in, in, in basically their, 
in basically their market. Uh, so, you know, the Fed, along with other federal uh, federal uh, depository institution examiners, does uh, you know hold banks to these 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 requirements. And it comes up sometimes also when banks are proposing to merge. Sometimes there'll be um, uh, comments or uh, or even protests. I'm not talking about people holding signs, but a legal kind of thing. Uh, protests from um, from community groups or nonprofit groups to say maybe this merger shouldn't take place because this uh, either this acquirer or target hasn't really met their Community Reinvestment Act obligations. Um, so um, uh, you know those those are the types of of activities of the Fed that touch on some of the things you're trying to, you're, I mean, that you're, that you're talking about. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Glenn. I have a question, Elizabeth. So, you know, you hear and you see in the, you hear on TV and you read in the paper about the Fed and how many hikes are going to do this year. Is it three? Is it four? <laughs> yeah. And we as, from the investment desk, we are concerned about that and we're concerned about the timing and, and what have you. Right. For the general public and the board, how much should they concern themselves on how many times the Fed moves, when it moves? Do you think that's important to them at all, or is that just in the big picture not going to matter? Um, well, I'm not an investment manager or, or, or a portfolio manager. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I'm not quite sure what to say. I, I, certainly, what I've provided you here with is a pretty is a pretty um, uh, I, I hope pretty clear picture of the Fed's um, motivation for the uh, for the increases in the interest rates that have taken place already, and uh, uh, probably your best source for. Uh, for getting a a broad picture of you know the future path of interest rates is to look at for example the speeches of the FOMC members both the governors and the reserve bank presidents um, and including the chair uh, and the um, and you know the I'll put up a slide here at the end and um, like the testimony of uh, the testimony of the chair, I think Powell just testified earlier this week, I think, uh, before Congress. Um, and uh, so so you can get a good sense of the direction things are headed. Uh, I leave it up to the professional portfolio managers um, and investment advisors and so forth to determine you know whether, you know whether they're going to get, uh, uh, you know, whether they feel they need to be focused on, on you know exactly how many and exactly when. So, Tipper, anyone else? We don't have anybody else in line. So Elizabeth, okay. thank you so much for coming and spending time sure. with us. I Rosie, just wanted to wrap up. Oh, with go ahead. One slide. I'm sorry. Uh, so I, I mentioned. Um, so the the. The information that I gave, uh, the, the there was some background background information, some uh, quite a bit of context, uh, but regarding current economic conditions and the forecast, uh, reflects very much what you can find in uh, the Fed in uh, now online publication called Fed Views, and these are written um, each month by an economist in our research department, and there's always um, I didn't have it here so much, but there's always a sort of special topic that the economist will address. Uh, for example, this month, um, Mark Spiegel talks about um, some risks uh, from what's going on in Europe, especially Italy, and uh, some emerging market economies. Uh, so for, uh, as I mentioned, these other resources, if you want to follow the Fed, and I think uh, many of you are probably familiar with many of these, uh, the FOMC minutes, press conferences, uh, the congressional testimony. And the last one is not, well, I think you can really learn a lot from this. So Google, um, chair the Fed. It's a monetary policy game. 
that you can play on your phone. <laughs> and um, yeah. if you succeed in uh, after, what is it? I think 20, I'm, I'm not sure, um, 20 quarters, something like that. Um, if you succeed in hitting maximum employment and inflation, you will be reappointed. So give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> ah, super. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Anybody? Any? Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Rosie, thank you for finding our speaker. Glenn, thank you for helping her with that. And we appreciate your being here with us today. All righty. Jack? Would you like to do your um, executive officer report or before we roll back to our work plans, what would you like to do? Well, Chris is checking. I do want to make sure that uh, most everyone on the board has met um, our new CFO, Julie Underwood, who's right here. Julie, you want to stand for the audience so everyone knows you in the audience? Yay! She started to work here on Monday, and uh, if you didn't see the press release, brings a, a really nice resume credentials for the organization. Not only has she been CFO for eight years at the San Bernardino County Pension Fund, but and is a CPA, uh, but she's got a nice combination of public and private sector work experience for us. So um, having worked uh, in private accounting firms, that, that adds just a, a little bit better perspective, I think, to all of what we do here. So we're excited to have her here. She's just kind of relaxing this week, so we're not burdening her with any board stuff, but uh, she'll be all ready for us all on in September. Ready? Oh, we're still waiting for you. So why don't we go to the... We're still having some of the employees come down for the virtuoso uh, announcement, Cassandra said. So do you want to do the business plan, please, now? Is that... Should we do that? Oh. Yeah, we're are still waiting for somebody to... But everyone's here, you think? Yeah, I think so. All right, then. Perfect. Let me get a... Uh... Yeah. All right. You guys want to put up the PowerPoint? And, uh... Yeah, it does look like a walkie-talkie. Mm -hmm. Right, before you go ahead and introduce the yeah. our for show so why don't why don't you go ahead and do some other parts of your report? You ready for that? I am. Okay. Well, I mean, is there anything that you want to do before we do our? Just that you know, we I did want. I'm very proud of the work. We we highlight some of the work around our workforce plan leadership development series for you in here, and um, there are two really extensive reports that our HR staff has put together in this area. And, um, we started to present some of that information as well to the staff in town halls this last week. And it might be something to bring into one of your offsite discussions as well. I think you would be surprised um, some of the things about our workforce and how it differs from the state workforce and differ from the general economy in terms of um, the generational d data. So one thing I'll just throw out with you so, so you know it's kind of surprising is that this workforce here at Calisters is much younger than the state workforce. In fact, by about 10 percentage points. Uh, we have a, a much larger bubble of millennials and a much smaller bubble of baby boomers that work here at Calster. So it's very different, mm -hmm. and, and I and I and I don't know what's causing that difference in hiring practices here. Is that but true five years ago, or is that is that a new? I don't know the change date on that. I don't. I don't want to say that. Just, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. That's a new piece. Thing. And the th one thing I, that may not, it surely doesn't surprise you because you see us visually, um, but we have a, a extreme uh, difference in gender proportionality here in this organization than as the state as a whole, whereas the state is reasonably balanced between males and females. And uh, for Calsters, the organization is 59% female and 41% uh, male. And what's interesting is that even at the leadership level of the organization, uh, where you might expect the normal effects of bias and glass ceilings to have a lesser percentage of females in leadership positions and whatever your percentage would be. Uh, we actually have a higher percentage of females in leadership positions than we do in rank and file positions. Mm -hmm. So again, just some interesting things that come out of this workforce uh, work analysis that we do that, to make us understand the organization better. 
So let me turn to our what, the best part of the whole year, and that is recognizing the virtuosos in the organization. And these are a small group of employees that have gone through an elaborate nomination process who deliver superior sustained performance with a demonstrated impact on this organization and really exhibit the core values of this. And I like to always introduce them to you one by one and just do a snippet of what each one does because it gives you a sense of some of the jobs in the organization. You generally see the leadership before you each year, but you don't get to see the heart of the organization, all the people doing the hard work every year. So we, I think before you is kind of a brochure of um, mm -hmm. with a photograph of each person, but I'm going to put their photo up on the uh, big screen here. and. If you did, those of you back, if you'd stand stand up when I announce your name, and oh and we will. <laughs> we'll compare the photos. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, so first, Monica Davila. Monica, where are you? Yay. All right. Now I don't know if everyone on the board knows what SharePoint is, but it's a key piece of software in any That's business sort of, nowadays. Was, so that was one of my questions to ask. Uh, Monica is our funny. senior SharePoint specialist who leads efforts to analyze SharePoint, pro SharePoint problems, requirements, requests, and proposals for custom sites, web parts, and applications. She develops complex SharePoint sites, including custom templates, workflows, and other functionalities. SharePoint is uh, the heart of many of our um, uh, projects and, and, and initiatives in the organization where we share information among the whole organization. That's SharePoint. And so it's a very effective tool we're all using. So thank you, Monica. And you'll, and for those of you that have been with us a few years, you'll see we have a new photographer. So we have a different little yeah, different, different style this year that we chose yeah. for, uh, for, the, for everyone's photograph. So hopefully you appreciate that. Christine, who I have worked with very recently and our... <laughs> Christine. Christine is responsible for directing the day-to-day -day activities of our classification, compensation, performance management, talent acquisition, and labor relations areas here. So obviously, the, the major areas of human resources. She was uh, instrumental in her and her staff in helping me on the selection process for our new chief financial officer. We chose not to hire a search firm and do it ourselves, even though it was a very senior position here. And uh, they did a super job of getting us a terrific applicant pool and a terrific finalist. So thank you, Christine. All right. Steven. Nice look there. Stephen works in benefits and services, our largest branch here, and he works on the benefit adjustment team. He is primarily responsible for processing post-retirement excess earnings workload calculations. This requires initiative, independence, good judgment, and interpreting and applying laws in a very complex area of calculation for us. Thank you, Stephen. Jeff Dusing. Jeff. Jeff works in our administrative services branch. He is our organizational training coordinator who analyzes, develops career development processes in relationship to CalSTRS competencies for the organization. All right, next up, who Kevin is not here today because he's working down in Southern California. But uh, I believe I have this right, Sandy, but I believe Kevin was really our first hybrid specialist that we have in the organization. Now we've replicated that model throughout all of our regional offices. He performs all of the marketing for the Pension 2 program for Southern California school and community colleges, and he provides support to the member services centers, manager, and staff for all the financial uh, awareness, education, and outreach. He's been great down there uh, expanding our program. All right, Prashant, you are here. There you are. Prashant is a key uh, a lead, a person in our leadership team in technology services. He is our director of enterprise IT solutions and innovation. He leads the units that provide solution development and other various related support services aimed at delivering and optimizing enterprise-wide technology-based solutions to the business. We are all reliant on that area of the organization. All right, next. Kemi Meyer. Kemi also works 
is also one of our employees in technology services. She's a senior business analyst. She works on our most complex technical projects, one of which is Pension Solution. During 2017, her primary role was in support of this project's testing efforts. So as you, as you heard, how important that is. Next, we have Peter Mock. All right. Peter also works in technology services, and he's responsible for end-user computing services and support. Uh, Peter applies in-depth technical knowledge to improve the services for our personal computing devices and monitors and improves the processes for supporting these devices. Thank you, Peter. No. <laughs> All right, Valerie Getz. Valerie. Valerie, you may not know, but all of us that travel at Calsters know Valerie, and behind the scenes, she even is watching your travel. She is our travel manager, responsible for managing the travel program, and she does this very carefully. Uh, she catches everything. Uh, she assists in the reconciliation review of all of our travel da data for all the uh, traveling employees and board members at Calsters. All right. Thank you, Valerie. Melissa Gould. <laughs> Melissa's not here today. Melissa is on an all-day, all-night race, the Ragnar Trail Race, 17 miles. Do you know what that is? That's what she's doing right this second. <laughs> Melissa is the Quality Assurance Specialist in Financial Services who performs technical professional accounting activities to support complex quality assurance analysis of benefit payments and collections. Okay. And Kirsten... Where are you? Kirsten Gisela. She works in the general counsel's office, and she is our operations manager. So she has responsibilities to plan, organize, direct, and review the work of the operations staff responsible for the completion of complex and various legal administrative support tasks for the attorneys. And they're all dependent upon her for keeping the office running well. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And, and then finally, at least in your write-up, but I, no, I don't have a photo, is Carolyn Kubish. I did just want to mention she actually has left Calster. She's working now at another uh, state agency, but she also was nominated by staff and, and is a virtuoso. So here we go. So it's a great group of people, and their uh, photos will be memorialized on the walls of Calster for the next year. And uh, again, it's a terrific program and uh, amazing group of people. All right. So if you want to, did you want to restart the agenda kind of where we were before with the work plans? Is this all right? 